everybody's problem. Nobody wants it. Like, like um, you know, I, I don't have a problem. I walk everywhere I want to go. There's no de- there was no demand uh, for, for horseless carriages. So they became, if you like, experimental devices, playthings of the rich, um, uh, kind of like, you know, I think that I, I liken it today to those uh, folks who are taking that, those space tourism flights. You know, that's the kind of people who are, you know, kind of investing in and trying out these, these um, uh, newfangled machines. But the 1880s, so it's invented in 1885, to about 1900 is a period of experimentation of people trying these out. And they become kind of interested in racing these devices. Of course, horse racing is a long-established tradition. So let's, let's race these horseless carriages against each other. Um, well, Daimler and, and uh, Benz, they had invented uh, machines with, um, with the what they called the internal combustion engine. And bec- they were differentiating it because there were other machines that soon um, started to, uh, to work, which were external combustion engines. They were steam-powered engines. So steam-powered uh, cars were uh, popular in this era, and uh, they were uh, equally efficient to the internal combustion engines. So they would win some races, these steam-powered vehicles. Um, uh, here, here's a slide uh, kind of meant to represent that, you know, um, this technology didn't seem to have a future when it was first introduced, that uh, it didn't really have a, a function. And here's a slide that um, represents kind of, a, uh, shows uh, some, some real and maybe some fanciful steam-powered kind of vehicles that were kind of um, uh, around and available. So we use that phrase internal combustion engine without really realizing that it's, it's in reference to, in opposition to steam-powered uh, external combustion um, engines. But electric uh, cars were also a viable opportunity. And you can see here that, you know, in 1900, the various um, 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 uh, horseless carriages, I, I want to call them because I don't want to use the word automobile just yet, um, uh, more were steamers than were, and more were electrics than gas. Gas was, if not, uh, the, it wasn't a marginal technology, but it wasn't the dominant technology uh, for these um, independently powered vehicles at the time. Um, and um, for a while, uh, electrics uh, had, a, had a clear uh, lead, uh, the sort of the kind of, you can see uh, President Roosevelt here, uh, the first uh, president to ride in a, in, a, in, a, in a vehicle. He's riding an electric vehicle. Um, note that his security service is riding bicycles. Uh, I'll, c- I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but uh, there was, a, there's a, there's a, um, an interpretive moment at the turn of the century, 1900 to 1910, where the automobile technology might have gone um, electric just as well as, as, uh, as carbon-based fuels. And um, what, what, what determined the difference? Well, who was, who was riding these vehicles at the time? Essentially, the only people who could afford a vehicle were rich uh, men. And so um, what did they want to do with these vehicles? Well, they wanted to race them, mostly. And so most of the activity that we see in, um, in the automobiles were um, uh, rich people racing the cars. And um, these cars were, uh, so the electric car was convenient in many ways. Like, the convenient, you could push a button and start the electric car. Um, to, to start the gas-powered car, you had to turn a, a hand crank. And, you know, just like today when you want to start a chainsaw, you gotta, you got to pull or a lawnmower, right? you got to start the, got to get the spark going by, by, well, you know, the early internal combustion cars required that hand crank to get the engine going. And um, so that was physically hard, but also if you weren't quick, so the, the crank was removable, right? Once you got the car going, you take the crank out and you put it in the trunk or wherever, the back seat. Um, but if you didn't get the, the crank out quick enough, it would whip around and break your arm. So, so women tended to prefer, the extent that women drove, they tended to prefer the electric cars. Like, why not, right? They don't smell, they don't, you know, all exhaust, and they're easy to start. Um, but they became sort of feminized, and, and the men liked the noisy, loud, look at me kind of noisy, kind of speedy cars. And so that really is, uh, I'm not, it's not a word of a lie. This is why we have carbon-based fuels for our cars and not electric cars uh, starting from 1900. It could have gone either way in that era. There, think about it, there was no infrastructure for gas stations. Uh, there was no, you know, no infrastructure to charge cars. Uh, it could have gone either way, and it went, um, it went because these were more masculine, more manly, um, in the view of the people at the time. So, coincidentally, at least at first, and this was a coincidence at first, um, 1901, this same era as we're trying, the world is trying to decide gas or electric, Oil is struck in Texas. 
The spindle top geyser, 1901, January 1901, just the dawn of the new century, right? Um, some lucky Texas driller drilled a hole in the ground and out came hundreds of thousands of barrels of sticky, gooey oil, which if you remember um, the, the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, um, you know, Jed Clampett got rich on this, uh, on this moment. And um, Texas tea. Texas tea, that's right. And uh, Texas oil, Texaco, Gulf of Mexico oil, Gulf oil, now Chevron, uh, developed that field. And, um, and they, of course, automatically, suddenly developed a vested interest in pushing internal combustion engine cars, because now we have a surplus of gas, which up until this point was um, almost useless uh, oil until you found a market for it. So, so um, aside from the abundance of oil, though, something dramatically changed in this decade that changed people's perceptions of, of uh, a need for personal mobility. And this is the first of those other revolutions I was talking about. And this revolution um, was the bicycle. And not just the bicycle, but the safety bicycle. So on the left, your left, you see the penny farthing bicycle. And kind of like the gas-powered automobiles, this was a manly device, uh, hard to get on, hard to get off, uh, uh, very easy to break your arm or leg when it tipped over, um, uh, dangerous, used for racing, uh, um, and, and uh, not very practical if you're wearing the, the clothes of a woman in 19th century Britain. And so um, the, the penny farthing bicycle had not much of an impact on society. But in 1880s, the safety bicycle was invented, the safety bicycle on your right. And um, it dramatically changed people's relationship to mobility. It was a world-changing invention, maybe even more than the automobile in a way, because it got people used to the idea that they could get on, walk out their door, get on a device, and travel a fairly long distance, much faster than they ever could before, and uh, even faster than the horses, which if they could afford to rent or buy or whatever, a horse. Um, so the, the safety bicycle uh, was uh, suitable for women to ride, um, but not with the clothing that women normally wore in, in Victoria and England. And so it actually produces um, a social, well, it doesn't produce. It is part of a social revolution that's happening with women at the same time. We're, we're talking about the temperance movement. We're talking about uh, women's rights to vote, all happening, you know, the early turn of the century. And, um, and uh, women throwing off the strictures of uh, Victorian convention. Here's a slide of a mixed group of people just, in, uh, uh, just across the pond in Vancouver in the late 1890s, sometime in the 1890s, and um, give a little bit of a sense that, that these women are out cycling with their husbands and partners, I guess, probably husbands in, in this case. Um, and this slide here kind of suggests uh, sort of the how, how both men and women's, this is a Puck uh, magazine from, um, I don't know if the date is very clear, there, but I would say 1890s, kind of showing um, how women's clothing was transformed by the need for the physical freedom required to ride a bicycle, um, which was um, a demand that hadn't existed before. So first and foremost, the bicycle offered ordinary people for the first time ever the ability to expand the scope of their daily travels. They could travel farther to work. They could travel farther to shop. Uh, they could um, go to parks that they could never walk to. They could go to the beach. They could go um, to the countryside. That uh, image of, uh, of those um, Vancouverites in the park sort of indicate that for the, for the first time, it's much easier to get out of town. And a bicycle craze sweeps Western Europe and North America. Everybody, every adult has to have a bicycle. And, um, and it becomes possible because um, of another innovation that happened early in this century. But before I get there, I want to say the other thing that bicycle did, so uh, uh, the electric car, going back to electric car, was suitable for, for the period because there were no really roads outside of urban areas that, that any vehicle could travel on, bicycle or car. And so the electric vehicle had a range that su was suitable for urban areas. The bicycle, again, was trapped to the urban areas. But because it was many uh, members of the elite who liked their bicycle, they started to put pressure on uh, governments to improve the road system that radiated out from, uh, from uh, urban areas. So we start to get a better ro roads uh, movement and bicycle clubs organizing, trying to get um, uh, roads improved. And this also becomes, if you like, a precondition for the automobile. But before the bicycle price could get down 
to a place where it was affordable to every a person, another innovation have had to have happened, another revolution had had to have happened. And that revolution was a revolution in manufacturing um, that got its start with the War of 1812. So all of us here who are Canadian know that Canadians won the War of 1812. Um, and the Americans, I apologize to the Americans in the room, I'm feeling bad about this, but the Americans knew that they had blown it. Um, and they knew, they thought one of the reasons why was because in those days, uh, every gun was manufactured uh, uh, as an individual item by a gunsmith. So you wanted to buy a gun, you wanted to buy a rifle, you would go to a gunsmith and he would have, uh, he, would have ma he or his companions would have made the wooden stocks, they would have made the barrels, they would have forged the triggers, they would have manufactured, and man, man, by hand in French, them, you know, factored, they have made by hand each individual gun, it was a craftsman, uh, it was a work of art. And then when one piece broke, gun got jammed, trigger broke or whatever, um, nobody else could use it. They couldn't swap out a part from another gun. They had to find a gunsmith who would repair it. And the military thought, well, we can do better than this. What if we could make guns that were so finely manufactured that we could take parts from one and put it in another and replace? And so this idea of interchangeable parts was a product of the American military which started in around uh, about 1820, and it took them 40 years of effort to, to actually create a gun where uh, you could actually take all the pieces of a gun, throw it into a bin, pull any parts out, and assemble a gun from, from the pieces. So every piece was so finely manufactured that it could intersperse with other pieces. So this manufacturing technology, what we might call today the basis of mass production, uh, was uh, we owe the American military uh, for that little uh, innovation. And with that particular technology then, they could make these bicycles cheap enough so the average person could buy a bicycle and, and we have this kind of opportunity, if you like, for mass mobility by bicycle in uh, the late 19th and early 20th century. So, so, so far we've got, um, we had the Industrial Revolution and the wheel uh, as revolutions that were needed. Uh, and then we have um, the, the bicycle, uh, which d develops this demand for personal mobility. And we have the ability to manufacture bicycles cheaply, thanks to uh, this idea of interchangeable parts. And this is all now, we're now in the early 20th century, 1910s. All the pieces are coming together now for the automobile revolution, except for, for one piece. Automobiles were still way too expensive uh, uh, to be something that was driven more than, than by the elite. And, and, um, and so, you know, by this stage, I'm thinking of the, to, to buy a bicycle uh, in this era would be uh, what for me might be like buying a private jet or a, you know, super yacht or something like that. I mean, some people could afford it, but not on a university professor's salary. So, so, uh, th so th uh, there were cars around, b uh, automobiles around, um, but driven, uh, you know, uh, they were only driven by the elite and they were uh, rarities and, and they were promoted in, in the way you see um, in, in these advertisements. And um, it was an innovative technology. We might think of Elon Musk and Tesca, Tesla kind of, you know, a, in our current uh, um, framework. And so, um, the, the manufacturers who made these vehicles uh, tended to be kind of considered the elite of the of the manufacturing industry. Like you know, it was it was very prestigious to to manufacture these these vehicles, and and so they tended to be um, elite men who then named the vehicles after themselves. Um, and so we have um, Ransom Olds names his car the Oldsmobile. The Buick brothers name the cars after themselves. The Dodge family names the car the Dodge. And um, I have his name here. I think it's George Pierce uh, named his Arrow after himself. And um, we have, you know, the Benzes and the, and the Mercedes Benz. Mercedes, I think, was the daughter of a Benz and so named after his daughter. Yeah, thank you. We got some automobile um, knowledgeable fans here. Um, so, so what we have is... Um, all of these elite men manufacturing cars for themselves, really, and using these cars as status symbols, both 
status when they drove them, but status as the owners of these vehicles. And under this condition, there was really no, no desire to let the automobile, if you like, out of this elite club. Um, and no desire really to bring the price down, no need to bring the price down, except for Henry Ford. And Henry Ford was not one of these rich guys. Uh, he was a farm guy. He grew up on a farm. And uh, Ford had discovered um, uh, uh, that he could actually make a bare bones car and, um, and sell it uh, much cheaper. And uh, the cheaper he could get the car down, the, the, you know, um, he, w he was kind of going for the mass market, low markup kind of audience. And so he sort of said, if, if I can get the price of the car down, I can sell more cars. I, can get a, you know, I don't need a big margin, sell more cars. And so um, in 1907, in 1908, he introduces the, the Ford Model T and, um, and starts to manufacture that. And he finds that the cheaper he can make it, the more he can sell. That's not a surprise. So he's constantly looking for ways to get the price of the car down. And um, uh, it's, I guess, generally believed that he got his, his uh, ideas for, uh, for his assembly line from the disassembly line of the meat packing plants. So at a meat packing plant in that era, um, the butchers kind of stood in one spot. I think probably they still do, actually. In meat. Not that I've ever been to a meat packing plant, but the, the carcasses come to you, and you carve off your little piece of your, uh, the ham or the steer, and then goes on to the next butcher, and she, he carves off the next little piece. So he sent his staff out looking for ideas to get the cost of uh, manufacturing down, uh, saw this uh, disassembly line, and thought he could put this to work um, assembling uh, vehicles. And so... April Fool's Day, 1913, he gives it a try. And he introduces the assembly line to build these magnetos, which is actually what he's you know, using, the, you're cranking on, the, on, the, on the, the, the crank to get the car started. Um, and um, he finds that, um, that uh, he can, you know, I think this says here, he can, he can dramatically increase the, the number of uh, and, and reduce the price of magnetos by just putting them um, on an assembly line. And this is his early version of assembly line. And you see what the workers are doing is they're pushing, they're assembling, you know, they're screwing, uh, propping in a few bolts, pushing it along to the next guy by hand, and somebody else is tightening them up and pushing it on the next guy. So this next innovation was to put it on a conveyor belt. And in that way, so this way, it's the slowest guy in the line that is controlling the speed of production. But a conveyor belt term determines that everybody works at the same speed uh, on the assembly line. Um, and so uh, in this way, he introduces, uh, if you like, um, uh, the assembly line, the modern assembly line. So um, by the middle of 1914, the first year of assembly line production, the price had fallen from a cost of $2,800 per car to $490 per car. And by the end of 1924, when he had built 10 million of these Fords, he was selling them for $290 a car. So a 90%, almost 90% reduction in the price of automobiles by virtue of, of this automation. And by this time, America was the most motorized nation in the world. It was no longer a, this was, this is the automobile moment, the self-propelled, this is mass use of automobiles. So this is, this is where I think the automobile, you can say, you can say maybe, um, uh, April Fool's Day, 1913, is the start of the automobile revolution. Well, outside of meat packing, no workers had ever worked on an assembly line before. This is a totally novel kind of uh, a thing. And um, this may be no surprise to you. Anybody here ever worked on an assembly line? A few people here worked on assembly line. So this won't be a surprise to you folks, but people didn't like that. Um, they didn't like it. Um, and, and so uh, Ford had this problem. He had these... oh. Ford. Let's, let's look at Henry Ford and his Model T here for a second. Um, uh, well, so um, before I get to the problem, I just I guess want to emphasize this historic moment because um, uh, if you look around the room, look up, look down, look what's on your hand, look at your watch, uh, everything in this room was probably built on an assembly line. I mean, there's a few exceptions. I see some earrings, uh, you know, there's maybe some handwoven scarves uh, in the room. There's, a, there's a, a ring, maybe. A few things in this room that weren't built on assembly line, but like even probably the chicken we ate was grown on an assembly line. 
So what Henry Ford did, really, was not just build an assembly line for cars. He changed the world with his assembly line. And he made mass consumption possible. Uh, I'm, I'm arguing here that just about everything in our world, well, not everything, but many things in our world, um, are thanks to that innovation of the assembly line. But as I said, Ford had a problem. His workers actually uh, didn't love standing at the same spot and putting on two bolts and, and, you know, and having the next uh, thing come up in two bolts. Um, and he found that he had this massive factory, um, but this enormous turnover. And so in the first year of his assembly line, his turnover rate was 380%, <laughs> which meant that for every job, he had to hire almost four people for every job in a year. And uh, his River Rouge plant, which I'll come back to that slide, um, there were uh, 50,000 workers at his River Rouge plant. I mean, these, uh, and so if you imagine if you had to fire, hire four people uh, every year for that, um, this is a problem. He's making lots of money. He's getting the price down. So he, he offers his workers, if you like, a bargain. He says, what if I reduce your hours from $10, uh, 10 hours a day to 8 hours a day and double your wages? What if I took your wages from $2.50 a day to $5 a day? What if I offered you $5 twice your wage for a shorter day? Would you stay? And over time, the worker said yes. And what we have here is a bargain that labor made, uh, that labor has made over the century to sacrifice um, satisfaction at work for satisfaction, consumer satisfaction. We're taking higher pay, we're taking fewer hours, uh, and we're sacrificing any joy at work. And that's, that's the bargain of the, of the, if you like, the 20th century. That's the bargain of mass production. Um, and so Henry Ford offered us this bargain, and us as a society, we took the bargain by and large. Um, so that's an extraordinary move. Imagine, uh, those of you who pay attention to these kind of things, um, the, uh, the union uh, UAW, United Auto Works, has just signed um, a series of contracts with Ford and General Motors and whatever Chrysler's called these days, Solantis. Isn't that a, isn't that a, a male erection uh, medicine, is not uh, uh, mixing that up, or is, anyway, anyway, um, maybe I got that wrong. Anyway, so um, anyway, uh, UAW has signed a, a, a contract, and it's it's a it's a rich contract as far as I can tell. It's uh, like twenty five percent over five years. That's a that's a pretty sweet contract for uh, union labor workers. But like, if if they were matching Henry Ford, if they were matching what he did they would have given the workers a four-day work week and uh, doubled their wages immediately, not 25% over four or five years. So, I mean, this is, I mean, this is a, an amazing kind of uh, transformation. So, so, even before I get to talking about the car itself, we see all of these transformations that the automobile has already made, right? It's uh, created uh, the assembly line. It's created the possibility for mass uh, consumption. It's created um, a new mode of work where we trade uh, consumer satisfaction for work satisfaction. Um, and, um, and so um, uh, workers uh, have, have made this bargain. Now, um, third, I guess, uh, uh, thing to talk about, and this is more of an American phenomenon than a Canadian phenomenon, but it's worth talking about here. Um, even with this new wage, Oh, and actually, even before he offered the $5 a day, uh, Ford was having trouble attracting white workers. And um, he was one of the few American manufacturers in this period of the early 20th century who would hire black workers. And uh, there weren't many blacks in, uh, in um, Detroit, where the automobile uh, had, had um, kind of centered. And, and so he, he started to uh, draw black workers up from the U.S. South. Uh, uh, U.S. South, of course, is this horribly racist place in the 1920s. This is the era of Jim Crow. And, um, and so over the course of um, uh, uh, between 18, 1900 and, and the First World War, something like two million African Americans moved from the South to the industrial cities of the uh, North, North uh, mid Midwest. So Detroit, uh, New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh. Um, 
and they came mostly to work in the automobile industry or in the subsidiary industries, the steel making industry, obviously supplying the automobile industry. And this created thriving black communities in these industrial cities of the Northeast, and um, as other employers started to break this, this color bar. And um, this is a bit of a kind of a, you know, uh, something you can maybe pull out uh, at the cocktail party when you need to, you know, just throw in something. But um, so uh, and maybe you all know this, I don't know, but um, Detroit was also known as Motor City by this time. Um, it's also known as Motown. And it's these black communities that have grown up in Chicago that produce the music that we now know as Motown music. Um, but this is a, a very racist society, even in, in the American Midwest, even in, in the American North. And so, um, so many of the white workers uh, were uncomfortable having black people moving into their neighborhoods, moving, uh, living on their streets. And so what did those workers do? Well, they looked for ways to move out of the city. And they take the new highways that have been built to support the automobile um, to move into suburbs, which are increasingly accessible to them. I'm going to come back to suburbs in a, in a few moments. But I'm going to take a little sidetrack here before I get there. So Henry Ford uh, offered this amazing deal to the workers, uh, and uh, they took it. And the automobile workers, for a while, became the best paid workers in America. Um, that was great. Um, but you know, along came the Great Depression, and, and uh, you know, uh, pressure was put on, on, on wages everywhere. And, um, uh, and, and, and uh, um, Ford was vehemently anti-union. Uh, anti he was also an anti-Semite and other things, but um, he was anti-union. And so um, unions didn't really take hold in the automobile industry until, until the 1940s. And in the 1940s, of course, labor has this huge um, advantage because uh, war is happening around the world and uh, labor is in demand. America eventually joins the war. Uh, labor is short. Unions... Um, um, uh, uh, the president offers some favorable um, legislation to help unions during the war, um, and labor uh, uh, unions take hold in, in the automobile industry. And, th and they take hold in the automobile in industry now at this time, not because of Henry Ford's largesse or brilliance or anything, but because there's one fatal flaw in the capitalist uh, system when it comes to these huge uh, centralized manufacturing plants like River Rouge and the assembly line. And that fatal flaw is this. You might have uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars tied up into this, uh, this plant, but it only takes one angry worker with a wrench to drop it into the conveyor belt and grind the whole factory to a halt. And so uh, workers actually, in this kind of highly centralized and capitalized world, um, realized they had this enormous power, and they could shut these plants down easily. And, uh, and hence, we see this, this nice, rich, um, a UAW contract recently, but um, the, UA, the UAW now is actually only recovering some of the gains it lost when the, the big crash of 2008, actually, because in the 1940s, the automobile workers became the best, the highly unionized and the best paid workers in America. So 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, all the way up to 2008, the financial crisis when, um, uh, when the, the automobile industry kind of went in the ditch and they had to surrender some of their benefits. Uh, so the automobile workers um, became, as I said, the best paid workers in America. They became the gold standard for Ameri all American workers. They, all American workers then wanted the contract that the automobakers had. And this created a virtuous cycle in America, which isn't replicated, and in Canada too, because Canada has some spillover from the automobile industry. It isn't replicated in other automobile-making countries. So you think of other countries where automobiles are made, Japan, Korea, um, uh, England, um, Argentina, Brazil, other places. They, they, th this virtuous cycle that I'm about to describe didn't happen in other countries. It happens in America. It happens in America because of these unions able to n negotiate these high wages, which meant that the workers could afford to buy the things that they built. So only in this is actually more generally true, but only in North America, it's not even quite the same in Europe, um, workers were able to, were paid enough that they could buy the things that they built and buy from other manufacturers who then paid their workers well and created this virtuous cycle in America which lasted uh, right through the 1970s. So what I'm trying to argue here is actually the automobile industry is responsible in a way for the American way of life, for the consumerism, for the wealth, for the GMP, uh, America, and it's thanks um, in part to the labor unions. 
And here's just a slide uh, to show uh, some of the struggles that uh, the unions uh, faced uh, on their way to organization. Um, uh, a little, an incident where uh, Ford uh, was trying to um, prevent unionization of his, of his factories. And so here we have an emblem of the, you know, the American way of life. And, and the, American, the, the car was both a symbol of the American way of life but also, in a way, a driver of the American way of life. It created the American way of life. It was an embodiment of the American way of life. So some of these, if you like, are kind of structural ways that the personal mobility, the car, has changed um, our standard of living, made, in many ways, our standard of living. Um, now I want to talk about some kind of other, uh, kind of more kind of um, uh, individualistic or maybe uh, less kind of institutional ways that the automobile has changed our world. So. Ford's Model T, he started building the Model T in 1908, and he, he built the last one in 1927. It did not change over those years, like almost did not change. He actually did introduce electric lights, I think, at one moment, and there's a very small little changes. Um, um, but the car, each car was identical almost from the beginning to end, and um, uh, Ford was famous for his expression. Uh, he said, uh, you want a Ford? Great. You can have any color you like, so long as it's black because I only make black cars, because black lacquer dries faster than the colored lacquer, and so that's the cheapest car I can make. And so um, uh, for Ford, the automobile wasn't a status symbol. It was a, it was a mode of transportation. But um, as I mentioned, um, you know, the origin of the car was as a status symbol, and it wasn't going to take long after Henry Ford started making these identical cars that other people wanted cars that would represent them as status symbols. Um, so for drivers, it was different, and, and you can find quotes like the one I'm about to give you uh, right from the 19-teens right to the present day, but I'm going to quote uh, from a magazine article in 2018 just to give you the flavor of, of uh, what cars mean in America, and maybe you'll, f you'll feel some of that in Canada too. So this is a quote from a magazine um, in, in 2018, and the source is not so important as the, as the message. Cars have become an integral part of our lives. And for many of us, they represent more, much more than just a mode of transportation. They are symbols of freedom, independence, and individuality. Cars are more than just machines. They represent our desire for independence, our need for speed, and our quest for adventure. So the car is not just a technology, clearly. It's a, it's a culture. And, and, and it's an ecosystem in a way. I'll say more about that in a minute. But so the origin of the car as a status symbol could not be repressed for long. And soon one of Ford's competitors, General Motors, started to catch on to the idea that um, we, can, we can play on, we can benefit from this notion that people want cars as mobile status symbols. And how are we going to do that? We can't use Henry Ford's model. Every car is the same. They all look the same. And so we're going to uh, combine a series of different kind of automaker manufacturers into a one a larger company called General Motors. And we're going to sell a car for every price range. And uh, what this does, of course, is it means that my, my income, my status, my wealth level is immediately discernible from the car that I drive. And so uh, this means that, you know, um, uh, as, as, as somebody who, who maybe wants to, um, you know, show my, my status and my, uh, I'm rising in the world, I want to buy a newer, higher, better car on this uh, scale of cars um, every, every time I can. And, um, and, and then not only that, though, General Motors got the idea that, and this, of course, is antithetical to Henry Ford, that what if we changed the look of the car every year? What if we changed it a little bit every year so you could tell whether this was this year's car or last year's car or a five-year-old car? Because everybody will want to have the new car, right? And so um, um, General Motors hired this genius designer by the name of Harley Earl. Harley Earl, the Da Vinci of Detroit, who designed uh, much of uh, General Motors cars for almost three decades. And, and he says, um, our big job is to hasten obsolescence. In 1934, the average car ownership span was five years. Now, 1955, it's two years. When it's one year, we will have a perfect score, he said. <laughs> this is Harley Earl in one of his, uh, one of his designs. 
So for North Americans in the 1950s and 60s, and actually probably still through to this day, um, the automobile is the single biggest investment that individuals make outside of their houses. And, and as that single biggest investment, it is a mobile status symbol that travels with you everywhere. You park in the front of your house, you park in the front of your work, you park in the shopping center, you get in and out of it. It, it represents you um, to the world. Um, and Henry Ford, he sold his cars only for cash. You, if you wanted to buy a car, you come up with your $290, you put it down at the Ford dealer, they'll give you a card. General Motors, though. General Motors came up with the idea of We'll blend you money, so you can actually raise your status before you actually have the cash to raise the status. You can, we'll lend you the money on time, and you can pay for your status later on. Uh, so it was General Motors who introduced the idea of, of consumer credit, something else we have to thank the automobile for. Um, so, so when I started the talk earlier, I said um, that you know some of the ways I'm going to talk about the car are obvious uh, and some are less obvious. So some of the obvious ones that we have to talk about, of course, um, are how uh, the automobile created the highway system uh, in North America, how highway system generated suburbs, uh, how suburbs have created urban sprawl, um, how suburbs create a particular culture, uh, and how in many cases uh, suburbs hollowed out downtowns. Suburbs were zoned to prevent businesses from actually operating in a suburb. They were designed uh, for bedroom communities. They were designed for you to sleep in and, 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 and not do much more in. Uh, if you wanted to shop, if you wanted to go to work, um, suburbs were designed for you to hop in your car and travel uh, a distance in your vehicle. And, and once you're in your burbs, uh, which is often on the outskirts of town, when you left your burbs to go shopping, you got to a corner and you had a choice of going left into town where you'd find congestion and hard to park or whatever. Or you could turn right and go to the shopping mall that was just built in that empty uh, field just down the road from you and uh, have free parking. And uh, I'm coming back to free parking in a few moments. Have free parking. Um, and so uh, shopping malls uh, were invented in 1956 by a man called Victor Gruen, um, who has been called because he has, he has uh, generated the shopping mall, which arguably is the... Um, emblematic piece of architecture of the late 20th century. He's been called the master architect of the 20th century. 1956, the first shopping mall in Wisconsin and spread out. Um, I'm gonna now, speaking about suburbs, uh, uh, we have a little story that's more American than Canadian, but um, it has its uh, echoes here in Canada, um, and that's uh, racism. So earlier I mentioned that about two million African Americans from the South, uh, U.S. South, moved to the Midwestern uh, cities, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Chicago, other places, to take jobs uh, in that kind of period before uh, uh, World War II. And then in the 20 years around World War II, another three million African Americans uh, moved uh, north into these, um, into these cities. And w whereas before, Suburbs that existed before the automobile, thanks to trains, thanks to trams, there were small suburbs that were spreading out around the largest cities in the world. But, um, but the automobile, of course, created this opportunity for personal mobility and expanded the opportunity for suburbs. And, and as black families moved north, uh, white families fled um, to these new suburbs outside of the city limits. And the, the post-war period was a period of financial boom in America. There were benefits for returning veterans to build houses. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the automakers were driving up, the auto unions were driving up incomes, and, and so the suburbs exploded all over uh, North America, Canada, and U.S. And in many of these suburbs, uh, covenants were put on the properties to prevent undesirables from moving into the neighborhood with you. So you're whites, you're fleeing the downtown, you don't want blacks living with you, and so you put a covenant to say no African Americans can buy in this neighborhood. Our local version in Victoria was Uplands where the covenant said no Chinese could buy into Uplands. And I think some of you, maybe some of you are from Uplands, some of the properties in Uplands still have that covenant. Uh, if they haven't changed hands a lot of times, that covenant still exists there. Ha I mean, I think it's been legally revoked, but probably still sits on the titles. So suburbs uh, needed to be served by highways, which would bring the workers uh, into town and shoppers uh, into the malls. Um, and it came, when it came to where to build highways, though, the cheapest land was often these poorer neighborhoods where blacks lived in these American cities. So uh, highways became uh, actually uh, um, 
uh, sources of racial violence were, uh, were often pushed through poor neighborhoods, uh, in America, black neighborhoods, um, and then these, these massive asphalt walls would divide the black part of town from the white part of town. And uh, th those of you who are familiar with Vancouver and maybe know the history of Vancouver, Vancouver almost had its freeways. And it has a little element of the freeway system that got built before it got stopped, and that's the Georgia Viaduct. The Georgia Viaduct was built, well, it was built for the highway system, in the 1970s. And um, to build it, they bulldozed Hogan's Alley, which was the historic black community in Vancouver. And if I had gone ahead, and I'm looking at my, my colleague Pat Roy, who knows way more about Vancouver history than I'll ever know, um, it would have uh, bulldozed much of Strathcona, uh, Chinatown, and uh, part of East Van. And uh, so it was a concentrated resistance of the, of the citizens of the city and those neighborhoods that actually literally, and this is, Vancouver is one of the few places that succeeded in stopping highway construction, and the Georgia Viaduct was really uh, the small part of that that's built. So when you drive, through, and I always notice this, you're driving through Vancouver, you're heading to East Van from downtown, you're on this massive highway for a few blocks, then, then you're down into the narrow streets of East Van. That's the remnant of, of the highway that never got built. Um, but all to say that they were often uh, victimized, uh, the poorer communities uh, who couldn't resist and, and who uh, didn't want these uh, things running through their neighborhood. Well, we can also spend a lot of time talking about the automobile and race in America, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try and wrap up in a few minutes. Um, so I'll just say a few more uh, words about the automobile and architecture. Oh, sorry, I missed this slide, but here's Victor and his, his major invention of the 20th, uh, 20th century. Um, before the automobile, um, when people used to walk and, um, you know, and, or, or drive to their small town and, 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 and park, in, in England they call these high streets, you would walk around the street and there'd be small shops, individually owned uh, some shops, often um, uh, owned by local business people, and they would have a signage outside which say, you know, haberdashery or tobaccoist or grocery store or... I don't know, surgeon, um, and, uh, and you know, you needed to you'd, you'd go in. But if, if you're driving an automobile down the road, you can't see these little signs. Um, you needed a new kind of architecture for the automobile, architecture that could be read at 30 kilometers an hour, 50 kilometers an hour, 100 kilometers an hour. So the automobile developed its own uh, architecture. Architecture for speed reading, you might say. Architecture that could be read at 100 kilometers an hour from a distance. So um, you need gas while you're on the highway? Well, you got to know, you know, two or three K out from the gas station that you're approaching a gas station. So the sign's got to be big. It's got to be high. Um, and uh, so a whole world was built. Uh, uh, so people who are traveling and can only see the world through this little windscreen um, and are traveling at, you know, speeds that range from 30 to 100 kilometers an hour, um, can see it from a distance. So we have this kind of our, our, our urban and rural landscape changes with billboards and, and these giant signs. Um, our mid-century automobile revolution spawned um, not only highways, but gas stations, uh, car washes, parkades, drive through restaurants, tire shops, strip malls, shopping malls, drive-in theaters, motels, motor hotels, a totalizing ecosystem engineered for the dominant organism, the car. And it also became, for North Americans, a home on wheels. And I'm not speaking just of the homeless here, either. Oh, here's a, a slide that just talks about um, how uh, so completely the automobile, it, it, in a way, it sort of immobilized us, because once we were in our comfy automobile, we didn't want to get out. So we would go to a drive-in thea drive um, theater, didn't have to get out. We'd go to a drive-in restaurant, didn't have to get out. Go to a drive-in church, you don't have to get out. Go to a drive-in bank, you don't have to get out of your car. Um, uh, ironically, and I'll come back to this, the car that was designed to make us free immobilized us. We got stuck in our seat, the driver's seat or the passenger seat of the car. So we don't have to get out to eat. We can just go to the drive-in th and, uh, and somebody will bring us uh, food to our window. Uh, there was a 1949 Ford brochure that said, the 49 Ford is a living room on wheels. Um, and and um, it also became... Um, dining room on wheels as uh, it introduced uh, the diner and also fast food. Um, uh, 
fast food was invented for the automobile driver uh, who didn't want to spend a lot of time in a restaurant, but also designed for the driver who moved around a lot and wanted predictability in their meals. They'd, they wanted to know if they went to a, a restaurant in you know, Vancouver, it would taste the same as the food they had in Kamloops, which is the taste the same as the food as they had in Medicine Hat, and would taste the same as the food as they had in Winnipeg. And there'd be no surprises, and the restaurants and the washrooms would be clean. And so um, uh, the fast food joints uh, took, took over uh, as a result. Well, the car also um, became a bedroom. I mentioned earlier that cars were designed and originally for men, but right from the car start, the car was gendered female. And immediately it was associated with sex. And like the bicycle, the automobile kind of allowed young couples to get out of the sight of their parents, to get off the front porch, to go somewhere far away. Um, and so um, it was a, a place of privacy. So the car has been described uh, sometimes as the most erotic of all technologies. And this Aston Martin ad on the right side kind of, I, I think that's fairly explicit about the sexual uh, kind of um, <laughs> connotation. I don't know about you, but... Um, but this, you know, you might think this is kind of a modern uh, kind of um, uh, a marketing technique, but 1905 uh, music uh, song, uh, In My Merry Oldsmobile. I'd, I'd sing this for you, but I, I am, I'm sorry, I just don't have the music in front of me right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, uh, Norman knows the song. Uh, shall we all sing together? You know the song? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, well, maybe not Norman. Okay. Um, but right from the start. Uh, the automobile was um, associated uh, with sex, and, and two scholars who have investigated this period have uh, estimated that 38% of all women born between 1900 and 1910 had their first sexual experience in a car. <laughs> now, those sexual experiences may have been in the Jordan Motor Company's Playboy Roadster, introduced in 1916, or in the Jewett Company's uh, 1925 uh, car with a fold-down bed, or in the 1936 Nash uh, car. As late as 1967, a survey showed that out of 1,100 marriages surveyed, 40% had been proposed in the automobile. A 2016 survey of 1,000 Americans said that 60% have had, shocking, had had sex in a car. 14% uh, had lost their virginity in a car. And this may even be true with some people in this room. And uh, yeah, raise your hand. Uh, and I, I'm not going to give anything personal away, but my first car was a Volkswagen station wagon type 3. <laughs> oh. So early car um, advertisements were all about the mechanical quality of a car. But, but uh, you know, they soon became about the other qualities of a car, the sexuality of the car, the masculine quality of the car. Behind in my slides here. Here's a slide that's suggesting the nice private space of an automobile. And, uh, um, but it was, it was an automobile manufacturer by the, a company by the name of Jordan, unfortunately no longer with us, but it's the Jordan who invented the car called the Playboy Roadster, who also invented lifestyle advertising. And uh, this, is, this is true. This is the most, one of the most famous, if you, if you study advertising, this ad I'm about to show you is one of the most famous advertisements in, in the Western world. It's called Somewhere West of Laramie. And uh, you probably can't read the text, but there's a little bit of up there uh, that I've, I've blown up for you there. And uh, the, a remarkable thing about this ad, really, you compare it to the early car ads, which are all about the mechanical qualities of the car and you know, how they drive and their speed and their safety and all that kind of thing. This mentions nothing about the car. <laughs> this is all about the feeling of being in a car. This is a, a widely recognized as the first lifestyle ad. It's in the Saturday, night, uh, Saturday Evening Post. And, um, and the j sales for these Jordan cars, which had been lagging, um, and there's kind of a, an anecdote behind the ad, uh, I can tell if anybody's interested later, but um, uh, Jordan sales shot up uh, with this ad, and other manufacturers then decided that the, you know, the heck with talking about you know, the speed or the safety or whatever the car, we're going to evoke a feeling that makes you want to buy my car. Here's another bit from the, from the ad. It says, step into the Playboy when the hour grows dull with things gone dead and stale. Then start for the land of the living with the spirit of the lass who rides lean and rangy into the red horizon of the Wyoming sunlight, twilight. Um, so 
The famous uh, psychologist uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers maintained that cars, to many men, have been, quote, an extension of themselves and a powerful symbol of masculinity and virility. The more immature the male, she said, the more his sexuality is apt to be linked to the car in their minds. In their minds, she says, there's a link between horsepower and sexual prowess, which leads to the assumption, the bigger the car, the better. So North Americans not only make love in our cars, we love our cars. We write songs about them. I, I bet in a few seconds, in a few minutes, you could think of a dozen songs that have automobile themes. And just for a second, just think, I'm not going to ask you this, but just think for a second. You know, um, uh, yeah, and there's uh, one of my favorites is uh, um, Chuck Berry uh, driving around with nowhere else, to, nowhere particular to go. Anyway, there's lots of you can come up with lots. Of, but not only do we sing songs about our uh, cars, we make movies. Oops, that's not where I want to go with this. I want to go here. We make movies about our cars. We love our cars. We name them. We include them in our, our most intimate, personal rituals. Cars have become a part of our, our not just our ecosystem, not just our economy, but our culture. Um, and, and beyond that, we love them so much that we've invited them into our homes. Originally, cars were kept in, in like car carriages were kept out behind the back, in the back of the house, right? In the stables, uh, you know, in, in kind of the sheds in the back. But in the 1920s, we invited the cars into our house and we gave a kind of a sexy French name, garage, to this room. Um, and it's not a small room either. Um, like, on average, they take up 15% of our houses, uh, car, uh, the garages do, garages do. Um, and in place of the front porch, which what people used to sit on the front porch and you would see your neighbors go by and you would engage your neighbors. Well, we've replaced the front porch, if you like, with these two you know, massive doors or sometimes three or four massive uh, garage doors, um, taking up as much of a third as, our, as our, our street frontage. The public social space in front of the house disappears and we push the family space, private space, into the backyard with our barbecue and away from the prying eyes of our neighbors. And uh, apparently, and I, this is a statistic I read on the internet, so it must be true, that 55% of Americans who have garages use the garage as the main entry into their house. So their neighbors actually never see them outside of their house. <laughs> we love our cars so much that not only do we park them in our cars, but on average in Canada and the US, there are 3.5 parking spots for every car in our country. For every car in our country, there are 3.5 places where we can park that car. 40% um, of them are uh, kind of our driveways and in our apartments and our condos. And then 25% of them are the businesses and, our, and the social places, the rec centers that we visit. And the rest are on the streets. We park our car. And, and many of these times we think, oh, that's great. I'm going to the shopping mall. That's free parking. But actually, you pay for that parking when you pay for the goods you buy in that shopping mall. The rent that person is paying in the shopping mall is paying for your parking spot. And so when we take the full cost of parking into account, the average household, and this is Canadian statistics, recent Canadian statistics, the average person pays $1,452 a year to park your car, our car. For the average household in Canada, 2.6 people, that's about $4,000 a year. And for all of Canada, we're looking at $52 billion we pay to park our cars. And we dedicate, in some cases, the most expensive real estate in town, like in the urban core. Many of us are parked next door here at the View Street Parkade. Yeah, put your hand up if you're parked at the View Street Parkade. Yeah, OK. That's really expensive real estate uh, that we parked our car in right there. And, um, um, and uh, we dedicate that space to our cars, which we love. Well. Um, We've got lots of evidence about the car as an enemy of nature, and I realize I'm, I'm running up against the clock, so I'm going to just skip through here. The car is, uh, we think about it as an enemy of nature, but it's actually the only way that most of us get to nature. Um, if, you, uh, uh, if, you, if you're going to pack up and go camping uh, on the weekend or, or sometime soon, my guess is you're going to pack your car to go camping. And... Um, you're not you, okay. But the car actually was the demand for, uh, the car uh, created the demand for, for parks, the park system, the provincial park system, the state park system, and the national park system are all a result of the fact that we're able now to get out of town and go visit our parks. So in a way, the car is an enemy of nature, um, and uh, in a way, it is a, uh, has kind of uh, fostered an appreciation in the neighbor. I'd be happy to talk um, uh, uh, more about the car and its, uh, and its um, 
uh, if you like, conflicting uh, relationship with nature. But just to wrap up, I want to talk, uh, just to say, uh, make a point that not only has the car created, if you like, the American way of life, but it's also created a new American way of death. And it's created an American way of death because so many Americans die when they get into the car. In fact, it's the most dangerous thing that you and I do in our day is to get into our cars. Um, every hour, um, oh no, I say, see, um, every 15 minutes an American dies in a car accident. Over 38,000 Americans die in automobile accidents every year. Um, the Canadian stacks are, are bad, but not as bad. So cars are a way of life, but they're also killing us. And they're killing us in this way but they're also killing us in ways that are much more insidious and less obvious. Um, America is the most motorized country in the world. It's also the most obese country in the world. For comparison, in 1990, only four states in America had obesity rates of over 15, of, of over 15%. Only, in 1990, only four states had obesity rates of 15%. No states had an obesity rate over 20%. In 2021, we see here, only four states have an obesity rate under 38%. And some states have obesity rates of 51%. And there are various reasons for obesity in America, but one of them is the immobility that results from an automobile world and an automobile life. And that other, uh, that other uh, graph over there, um, uh, it's not a definitive causation to, sh to show that there's a 90% um, correspondence between obesity and automobile uh, miles driven, but um, um, it shows uh, the, the, the two overlap in terms of um, causality, or there's a relationship there. We know that the lack of uh, exercise shortens lifespans, and obesity is linked to all kinds of things like diabetes and heart disease. And, and you might think of the car for all the other things the car is. The car is a device manufactured to make us exercise less. I mean, that's what the car uh, is and does. So there's that effect. And then there are other indirect uh, effects of the car. The car uh, causes pollution um, for many years um, uh, through the 20th century. It caused lead poisoning through the, uh, the lead in gasoline. Um, it causes, of course, um, uh, pollution. But when you take into all of the different ways, uh, and this is, um, uh, uh, so what we're seeing here is global, uh, percentage of global deaths caused by automobility. And um, you can see that on the far left, um, accounts for about, um, what are we looking over, almost, we can't see this, 15%, something like that, is it where we're at? Yeah, well, more than that. more than that, 70%. If you add up the various indirect causes along with the direct causes, you get about 35% of global deaths have some relationship to the impact of um, carbon-based automobility. And this is before we get to the catastro catastrophic effect of climate change and global warming. So now, a quarter of the way into the 21st century, we can look back at the age of the automobile with some distance, maybe with some nostalgia, probably with some regret. We can see the automobile has, has created a path dependency that's, that's difficult to escape. Our towns, our countrysides, our neighborhoods have been built for the gasoline-powered car. And even as we can see, as we drive toward the abyss of climate change and obesity, we can't seem to put the brakes on the vehicle. <laughs> As we search for a way to stop this catastrophe from happening, have saved poor Thelma and Louise, um, our best hopes are not where we thought they would be back in the 1960s. Our, our best hopes are not there. Um, our best hopes now, not saviors for sure, but so far the best we can come up with seem to be from the decade of 1900. Walking, cycling, and the electric car. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we knew at the beginning that we would not forget this evening because of the fire alarm, and now we've all forgotten that, and we will not forget this evening because of the excellent, excellent talk. Do we have any questions for our speaker? I'm going to Oh, good. Oh, you found one? No. No? Okay. No, that's, that's the good part. <laughs> oh, good. I see. <laughs> so... Oh... 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I looked that up, uh, and um, only about a third. Only about a third of people actually park their car in the garage. Uh, yeah, uh, and the rest, um, yeah, you know what they put in the garage. Things, that, you know, their garages are full, but they're not full of cars. Yeah, uh, I see Norman here in the front. Yeah. Okay, question on the autonomous vehicles that are being developed. Where that's going? This is the new yeah, where that's going. Well, I think it is going. I think, um, I mean, um, uh, I, I drive a relatively old car, 2008, I guess is that old? I don't know, medium, I don't know. Um, so it's got none of the newfangled, you know, mod cons in the car, like no backup cameras, uh, no self-parking, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, parking. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of people who have cars that, now park, you know, will do the parallel parking on their own, and they really love that kind of automated feature. Um, they like the, the ability to, you know, look, uh, have the car look backwards or whatever, cameras. Um, and, you know, I can see how it's kind of like, you know, the convenience that the car offered us is offering us more and more and more convenience and actually inviting us to be more and more immobile and more and more passive uh, in our, our, our control of the vehicle. So um, my thoughts on it are, I think, um, I guess we should be careful and... Uh, and, and kind of resist as long as we can, I think. is. Uh, <laughs> you know, they say that the, autom the, the automated cars will have less accidents, and that may, in fact, be true. I mean, uh, the, the, the most accidents are caused, actually, something like a third of all accidents are now caused by people on their cell phones. And, uh, you know, the other two-thirds, um, you know, a large, a large number are, are driver error. Um, and, and so it is possible uh, that, that, that we will be made safer uh, by uh, these automated cars, uh, but at the risk of giving up control uh, over uh, uh, how, they, how they operate and where they go. And I'm, I don't know, maybe that's a trade-off you want to make. I'm not sure I do. Yeah, okay, so the question is, can I talk more about the infrastructure required uh, to run the car and, uh, you know, the state involvement in that? And, of course, it's absolutely huge that, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, um, if we go back to the beginning of the automobile, who are the first people who are buying cars? And it's the rich industrialists who, uh, it's the Vanderbilts and it's the Rockefellers and others who are buying the cars. And uh, they want a place to drive those cars. And... Um, they um, um, start to form automobile clubs and organizations, the American Automobile Association, Canadian Automobile Association, uh, all of these kind of associations are lobbying hard governments for, um, for um, essentially subsidies for the automobile. They want to pave the roads. They want better roads. We want bridges. We want four-lane highways. We want overpasses. Um, and um, and uh, it has proven surprisingly popular with, uh, with the public who love their cars and who are quite willing to... Um, spend, uh, let's see if I can find an example. What do we spend on the McKenzie overpass? Uh, or the, you know, $60 million or something like that on that overpass? We're quite happy to spend that, um, but, uh, you know, we also need doctors and we also need hospitals and we also need other things we could spend that $60 million on. Um, and so, um, but the public uh, has, uh, has supported uh, government all the way along. Um, in America, uh, well, uh, actually, th those of you who have lived in British Columbia a, a long time uh, will remember uh, highway politics. This is how you get elected in British Columbia is you pave the roads, you build more roads, uh, you build a bridge, you build a Coquihalla. Um, uh, that's how you get elected in British Columbia. Of course, that was uh, even more true in America. And in America, the federal government was anxious to, to create a, a national road system, and, and it's a federal government, and they're not responsible for roads. States are responsible for roads in, a, in America, as in Canada. And so how did they do it? Well, they, they, they declared um, the, uh, the highway system to be a national nuclear emergency escape route for people to escape the cities in the event of a nuclear war. And so the federal government had to get involved in building these massive highways. So uh, it was, you know, a boondoggle, but it was essentially a subsidy to the, to the automobile. So not just the automobile makers, but of course the cement manufacturers, uh, the asphalt manufacturers, you know, uh, the engineers. Um, uh, so um, we have and we continue to way over subsidize the automobile as opposed to alternative modes of travel like light rail or something like that. Yeah. Thank. Good question. I have a question for you, John. Okay. It occurred to me as you were talking about Mr. Ford and the revolution that his operation represented, 
And somewhere around the beginning of your talk, you also talked about Elon Musk and you know how he's sort of a, a, a more modern revolution. And it occurs to me, and this is this is really superficial, but I'm curious. It occurs to me that they both used the phrase model letter in their cars. So we have the Model T, uh -huh. and then we have the Model S. Okay. Model three. All right. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do, you, do, you do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? No, I, I hadn't. I had. Well, <laughs> I, I I can't afford a Tesla, so I haven't thought too much about Teslas. But um, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that he's actually playing on that. Uh, oh, that would that, be interesting. That, yeah, I think he probably yeah. is. He's kind of playing on that legacy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I I I'm not a, an expert on Ford, so I don't know uh, what ha I mean, what happened to the model, you know, Z and the model U and Were the there model. Any? Where, yeah. <laughs> so uh, how did he get the T so fast uh, when it was an early car? Um, so uh, I don't know the explanation. We but don't I, know I what model T stands for. What the T stands for? No, I don't know. No, what does the anyone know in the audience? For. No. No. Mm. Okay, yeah, so selling more cars, more units. Well, it, it's not an uncommon strategy um, to, to lower the price, but I mean, you know, uh, uh, Musk is such a, uh, a complex figure. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to go there, but uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, the, the battery innovation that he has inspired, uh, it, it, it may, we may look back on that. I think that is one of the revolutions of our, of our time, the, the storage technology. Yeah, I, I think I do. I mean, I know expert on the engineering of all of that, and people will tell you that an electric car, you know, has environmental cost. Like you're talking in modern day, right? Right now, right? Yeah. So you know, the electric car, of course, um, um, you know, requires steel and requires all the kinds of things that uh, that a gas-powered car requires, um, and it requires some uh, minerals that are rare and difficult to mine, and often mined in very unsavory, well, not unsavory places, but places with unsavory administrations and, and poor work habits, uh, like poor work protections for workers. Um, so there are many ways that the electric car, you know, is not at the moment a perfect technology. Um, but you know, my view on that is um, those are the uh, and and an electric car doesn't solve any of our congestion problems, and it doesn't solve any of our suburban problems, and it doesn't cause many of our problems. But the only problem it does address uh, and, uh, is, is that 20%, 25% of the carbon that goes into the atmosphere through, um, through our automobile transmissions. And uh, to me, that's the crisis of our moment. And um, you know, I used to be an opponent of, uh, of uh, nuclear power, uh, and now I'm looking at nuclear power as one of the few ways we can get ourselves out of this. Out of this, this. So, so I think um, I'm adjusting my attitudes towards the challenges of the day, and um, yeah, so that's what I am on that. Yeah. Is it way in the back? There's a question here. Yeah. <laughs> and look at the model names up the Tesla's car. It's X3, X, and Y, and you can find it spelled sexy. Oh. Oh, oh. Is an inverted e. Oh, thank you for that. So that ties in with the eroticization of the automobile in a very backward way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Please uh, join me in thanking our speaker. <laughs> All right. Have a safe ride home in your cars. Okay. Careful when you get behind the wheel. Look both ways. And we will see you in December for something which is also dangerous to do with cars, which is drinking. All right. Good night. Have to be aluminum because they have to be light because the batteries are heavy. Is that why? The carbon output is much higher on the electric cars overall on the lights. Electric going to run them for over 50 years. Seems unlikely. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it.